I've got Stephen here on the phone, Stephen Broadbar from Cool Earth Action. Um, we had some connection problems with the Zoom interview, so I have his picture up here. Um, we're going to be chatting still. You can ask him questions, but first Stephen is going to introduce Cool Earth to us. We have a few cool videos to play you. Um, so why don't you take it away, Stephen? We don't, I don't want to take any more time from you. No worries, and thank you so much, Alex. Thank you for having me, and um, thank you for showcasing Cool Earth in your inaugural um, Mammal Community Spotlight Live event. Really honored of course. to uh, be part of this event. Um, and, uh, you know, I was just, I have to say, I was uh, not disappointed the video's not working. I was a little envious of your uh, Tanner and Amani coming from some really spectacular locations. Um, <laughs> And some of the guests have really been interesting. I, uh, I'm certainly open to uh, be a research assistant to Oliver and the world because I have a little bit of a fascination there. So I'm happy to be feeding them hot dogs at any time they need. Uh, but thank you. Thank you so much for having me out here. Um, I am coming to you live from Brooklyn, New York, unfortunately. And uh, I would certainly <laughs> love to uh, revisit the next community spotlight from one of our locations. Um, but when I was speaking to you and your colleagues, uh, the question came up, just what is Cool Earth? And I thought I would just, I would kick it off with a question, put a question out to the viewers and listeners. And that question is, here's the question. What has been the most important policy in reducing carbon emissions over the last 10 years? Most so important policy. What has, been the most, what has been the most important policy in reducing carbon emissions over the last 10 years? Yeah, personally, I'll have to think about that one because I do, you know, I try my best every single day to think about which of those policies to fight hardest for, right? Like what's going to make the most impact from my efforts. So I'm really curious to know what people think. Yeah, I will, I, I'll, I'll give a lead in that I, I have four in mind. Uh, one is, let's see what I'm saying. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm not sure if I have the live feed on my end coming in. So you can give me a heads up if one of the answers comes in. Will do. Um, we have four in mind. I mean, I think many people would think of renewable energy, which happens to be number four. Wind and solar, which has been getting more efficient every day, um, but certainly not as much as number three, which is hydropower. Okay. Which is always important. Um, and that also has been improving over the time. But I think the number one thing that people would think of when they think of carbon emissions is industrial carbon emissions, coming from the most industrialized nations, China and the United States. Sure. Um, but they might be surprised to find out that that is actually number two. And number one uh, is deforestation. And deforestation has more, greater carbon emissions than all three combined. And, wow. I, and I will say that that's, um, it is a, it's a staggering statistic and one that uh, many people don't think of. It's not necessarily intuitive that uh, while the world has about 2% of it covered by rainforest, um, the yearly deforestation emits more carbon than China and the U.S. combined. Wow. And, and so we actually yeah. have one answer from, uh, from Elizabeth asking about better fuel efficiency in cars is what she would have thought. Yeah, no, I think that um, I think that these are all very important issues. But I think, and this is probably one of the areas what that got me involved in Cooler from the beginning. But I will just share just to share a little bit about what Cooler is about. Um, we work with people. Um, we work along rainforest communities to halt deforestation and its impact on climate change. And we work, um, you know, there's 50 million people worldwide where the rainforest is home and it's habitat for half of the world's animals. You know, we, um, I see the photo that you have of me is actually, uh, the photo that you have on me on the screen is in Borneo against two photographs of, of uh, orangutan, which are part of a small section of rainforest in Indonesia, Sumatra and um, Borneo. And uh, it is home, you know, the rainforest is home to uh, many, many endangered species. Um, but we, we are, it is also home to about 25% of global carbon. And if the rainforest continues to be destroyed at the current rate, it will continue, uh, uh, they'll have a climate breakdown probably in the next less than 10 years. So we work, Cool Earth works with uh, people living in rainforest to tackle deforestation and fight climate change as we uh, champion communities living on the front lines of climate crisis. So I was wondering, could you, um, Alex, would you mind just putting up the video of Believing in People? Can you see that one, that first one? 
Yeah, the first video here. We all understand the importance of protecting the world's rainforest. Despite numerous initiatives over the last 50 years, more than half has been destroyed. Cool Earth has found the key to halt this devastation. People. People who rely on the forest they live in for their survival, for their livelihoods, for their future. Cool Earth partners with villages from Papua New Guinea to Peru so that they can take back control. By building sustainable incomes that keep the forest standing to achieve healthier, wealthier lives. The more villages that start doing this, the more rainforest we can protect. And it's working. From just one village in the Amazon, Cool Earth's partnerships now have more rainforest under protection by local people than any government or NGO. Over a million acres and counting. Today, we have a queue of villages waiting for our help. Villages that together can create a shield to stop the rainforest disappearing. With the backing of people like you, we can triple our impact by 2020. If you believe in saving the rainforests, it's time to believe in people. And I absolutely love that video. It just has such cool effects and it tells the story so well. Um, I see in it that we have a few donations here that just popped in. So thank you so much for supporting Cool Earth. Um, if anybody else wants to donate to Cool Earth during this talk or the rest of the event today, we're gonna have links in the chat that you can click. There's links in the descriptions of the live streams. And of course, in this little QR code in the corner, you can scan that, donate immediately. But uh, yeah, back to you, Stephen. No, thank you. And thank you for showing that. Um, you know, I think one of the, uh, one of the things that uh, you had asked me, Alex, earlier when we first met was what are one of the greatest success stories of Cool Earth. And I think what makes Cool Earth so unique is that we are unlike any other charity. We sort of turn the conventional conservation model on its head, where we willfully sort of circumvent government, focusing more on individual families, villages, um, who are doing an extraordinary job being the custodian of their own rainforest. Um, but I think one of our greatest successes, while we have sites throughout the world, in Congo, Peru, in Papua New Guinea, um, you know, we are facing, or they are facing, some hardships. Uh, new outbreaks of malaria, El Nino storms washing away their food garden, four to five children suffering from malnutrition. Um, so they really need this helping hand. And what we do, of course, does is a simple partnership where we just help build livelihoods to ensure that the waiting parts is worth more to them standing um, than it is to the loggers down on the ground. And more importantly, we create a sustainable income for the local people in these communities. Uh, where they sort of remain in control of the rainforest. Um, and this model has worked really well in uh, Congo and Peru and Papua New Guinea. Um, and I think our greatest success is that we sort of have a light touch model where the money, uh, early on when Cool Earth began, you could come on and donate 25 to $50 for acreage of rainforest that would be put in trust. And that money would be given to the communities. And we gave them the opportunity to just decide democratically how that money is spent. And we found that that is the best thing. They are the best at knowing where the money goes, where it should be spent. But the most importantly is to really understand, have that understanding on their end, that, that the forest is worth more standing um, than it is on the ground. And the last piece that I think is really unique that has that is caused, that has given us great success in some of our programs is um, every partnership has an exit date, an exit strategy. So in other words, we, can go over there every so often and see what's going on, but it's very important for us to sort of have a date in the diary where we say goodbye and we let them continue to use the funding as they see fit. Otherwise, this funding will dry out and there'll be sort of a dependency. Um, yeah, I love that. Like that's that's where the, yeah. the entrepreneurship comes into the equation, right? Making making sure that you you know teach someone to fish rather than giving them a fish, that kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's a really good analogy. And, um, 
You know, for me, my, my background, uh, I should say I'm, I'm uh, my work with coolers has been, been mostly a heart's work. I'm on the board and uh, sort of developing educational programming. Education is my area and educational professional development. And um, I know Pam has asked me um, how I came to know coolers, and it was sort of a happy accident. I um, tagged along on a press trip, sort of moonlighting as a journalist, to write about them for the American Museum of Natural History, where I was working for some time in the education department. And it was a fascinating experience. I went out to the Ashwinikin Corridor. I would, I would say it's the, probably the most remote place. But I think for me, um, what attracted me to becoming involved with Cool Earth is that I, I saw that there was this gap in education in this country, in the United States. Um, and that goes to the question that I posed earlier about, um, you know, what accounts for the greatest amount of carbon emissions. There's a question that was uh, put to me in a professional development setting once. I have a fascinating question. There was a video series called The Private Universe. I encourage anyone to Google it. It's actually a little dated from the 90s, but it's got a really good message. And the question, they, they posed the question to Harvard and MIT graduates. They still had their gowns on. They were right off the stage with their diploma. Uh, presumably two of the, you know, most prestigious schools in the country, if not the world. And the question is, where does the mass of a tree come from? Yes. Where does the mass of a tree I, I, I'm cheating because I've heard this question before, but I will see if anybody else can answer. <laughs> <laughs> it is a you wonderful know, question. Now, assume that air is like the reason that they're so massive. <laughs>
Well, I know that you sent me some images, Stephen, of the project, and tonight when we come back around to wrap this whole thing up, we're going to run through those in a little slideshow and see what this money can go toward. Hopefully by then we will have hit our goal. We're already more than halfway there, which is so exciting. That is fantastic. Thank you, everyone. It's really great to hear. So we have just a couple minutes left, and I'm curious, do you want to talk more about the education program that you started? Do you want to talk more about where the money is going? It's sort of up to you, Stephen, to take it from here. No, yeah, thanks so much, Alex. I think I'll wrap it up with, um, with my connection to Cool Earth and what my vision is for an upcoming project. Um, and hopefully I can come back next time to tell you as it goes. So yes. when I came back from this experience, yeah, when I came back from this experience, I thought there's this huge gap in education in this country. Um, and I ended up founding a fellowship, which I'll we'll see a video for really quickly, um, a Cool Earth Teacher Fellowship that supports the personal and professional development of teachers by providing us fully funded summer learning expedition, the Amazon Rainforest. So we bring educators out to the Amazon, the same site that I was at, which you'll see. We did a pilot program about two or three years ago, which this video will show. Um, but I figured through education is really the best way, how, how, best way of sort of educating people about the rainforest and its importance, and also sort of making it relevant. I mean, how do we make these scientifically significant areas of the world that are seemingly remote relevant to them? Mm -hmm. um, so I will end it with uh, having you just play this click. This is from yeah. our pilot part when we brought four teachers out to the Amazon and my colleague did a little video on it. Uh, so why don't you yeah, well, let's go ahead and end with that video. So thank you so much, Stephen, for working through all the technical kinks that we just had to still make this happen. It's wonderful to hear your voice and to hear the passion for Cool Earth and for the specific project. And I know um, I've seen this video. The education project that you're working on is incredible. So everybody watch this video, and then we'll be right with you with the next um, break segment, and we'll jump right into Dylan Jones. But we're going to wrap this all up with another um, look into the Ashninka project that we're donating toward during this Cool Earth fundraiser. So again, thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you, Alex, and thanks for all you're doing. Thanks, everyone. The rainforest is one of the planet's many essential functions, including regulating our climate. But how do we bring this exotic and remote environment into the classroom so students can appreciate and understand why it's necessary to preserve it? Well, here's how Cool Earth is doing it. We take teachers to the heart of the Peruvian jungle. But first, we have to get them there. Whoa, you're the man. Quite warm. Our teachers spend time living with the Ashninka tribe. They learn about deforestation, the role of trees in our climate, the people and their culture, and the many species of plant and animal. Clover Hicks is a biology teacher in New York. Her unique experiences have given her a rare insight into how plants are integral to the Ashninkan culture. And I've never seen this plant before, but it's amazing how it really is a pigment right out of the pod. Dan Roberts is an assistant head at a school in Cornwall. He explores the science behind the traditional manioc beer drunk in villages throughout the rainforest. The manioc roots being mashed up and then um, put in the mouth and using the saliva and actually spitting it back in. And what they're using the saliva for is that in saliva you have an enzyme called amylase and amylase is actually the thing that's then going to break down the sugars that's inside the root and that's going to help the fermentation process begin. We're about to go off on a hunting expedition as you can see. Don't know how long or where we're going but that's why I'm here. Believe it or not, Matt Zayner, a teacher from California, is a vegetarian. But that didn't stop him going on a hunting expedition with the village elder, Caesar. Wow! Out of nowhere, he has killed quite the large mammal. School children here walk up to two hours to get to class in the morning. Emily Courtier, a teacher from Sirencester in the UK, discovers the impact their changing environment is having on their personal development. So this is Lewis, he's 11 years old, he's just writing us a message that we can send back to the UK about the rainforest. These teachers have all experienced the Cool Earth Teacher Fellowship. Their role now is to create innovative and engaging teaching resources to inspire students and educators to learn about the rainforest and communicate that it's worth more to the planet standing than cut down.
is a black racer. Hello. Now, black racers, let me make sure I'm not seeing in fire in this here. All right. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Woo! You give me a little chase there. All right. Let's pull them out of fire in territory. Now, black racers, as you can see, don't have quite the temperament of a black rat snake. These guys are a lot more aggressive when you catch them. Now, normally, like, they're not going to come chase you down if you're just walking through a trail. But if you do happen to touch a black racer, it'll let you know. It gave me a nice little nip there. Now, you know, just bleeding a tiny bit. Obviously, it's not going to hurt that bad. I think I've got fire ants in my pants. Whoa! Ouch! Dude, that wasn't very nice. So, yeah, he, he's not a huge fan of me. And he really wants to take a chunk out of my face. <laughs> he's staring at my nose. Uh, yeah, so black racers aren't the nicest snakes when you catch them. He really is staring me down. It's kind of creeping me out here. Uh, but as you can tell, the black racer has a lot different body shape than a black rat snake as well. So these are a lot more long and slender than a black rat snake is. Uh, black rat snakes are constrictors, and black racers actually aren't. So these guys will just chase after the prey. They'll grab it, throw it around a little bit, and then they'll just swallow it. So this thing's just built for speed. As you saw, when it wants to go, it can move. Now these can race at about 12 miles an hour. It's actually not that fast. It's about as fast as a human uh, moves when they jog. But for a snake, that is really fast and it can easily chase down mice. Now the reason that these guys are so successful here is because, you know, the mice, they can go under holes and things pretty fast. Black rat snakes can follow them down there, but they're a lot slower than a black racer. So these guys can dart after a mouse super fast. And also, since they do have a smaller body mass, it takes them a lot shorter amount of time to heat up in the sun. So you can find these out a lot faster normally than a black rat snake, because a black rat snake needs to warm up its blood, so it has to be a little bit hotter for them to come out. But these are also very visual hunters. Uh, so right now, you see his tongue is flicking, so he's smelling things, but his eyes are huge compared to his skull. So he's, you know, he can see extremely well uh, from most snakes. And where we found him, we're in a place right now, it's just, you know, it has racer written all over it. Whoa! And all over it. Whoa! Over it. Whoa! Whoa. Did you get that? I got yeah, that one. Yeah, so he, he really wants my nose. Uh, this is where we caught him from. As you can see, I kind of dropped my bag in a fire ant mound, which probably wasn't the best thing, so now I can't drink my water. But actually, these fire ants, it's good that they're here. So we found him right here by this fire ant nest. He was probably two feet away from it. But fire ants are actually one cause. Let me throw this bag out of the way. Oh, hello. Okay. Seems you get a little calmer. You just gotta make slow movements. Yeah, he just really wants my nose. Yeah. Yeah, so, but fire ants are actually one cause of population decline in black racers because they do hang out in a very similar habitat. Uh, if a black racer is just sitting there sunning like this one was on a rock, the fire ants will just come kill it and sting it to death and eat it. Um, and, you know, these fire ants probably would have done that at some point in time if this thing would have been a little closer to their nest. Uh, but he was probably, what, they, what these guys do is they sit around these rocks and these tall grasses looking for mice and insects, things like that. Uh, now, lots of people do see these and they're scared of them because they move really fast, uh, but you should not, you have no reason to fear a black racer. They're completely non-venomous. Uh, it's a common misconception that racers are venomous, but I promise you they are not. Uh, so, once again, completely non-venomous, but they're also not a constrictor. He's a bit himself. Good job, bud.